Hi, my name is Rod Cleef, and I'm the host of the Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. And every week I interview multifamily rock stars, and we talk about how they've built incredible wealth for themselves and their families through multifamily properties. So hit the like and subscribe buttons and get notified every Monday when a new episode comes out. Let's get to it. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I know you're going to get tremendous value from the gentleman I'm interviewing today. His name is Jake Harris. He's an author. He wrote a book called Catching Knives about distressed real estate, which we're going to drill down on. But uh, he's done over, developed and acquired a couple hundred million dollars worth of real estate, uh, different asset classes. He's got another quarter billion dollars in development, uh, primarily focused in San Antonio and Texas, which is a market we love, as you guys know, and really excited uh, to uh, get into this with him. Jake, welcome to the show, buddy. Thanks, Rod. I appreciate it. Yeah, glad to have you here. And as we talked about before we came on, that was my stepdad's first name and beautiful human being came into my life way too late, left way too early. And uh, we had some laughs about uh, some of the stuff that he did uh, before we got started recording here. But why don't you take a minute and talk about your, pro you know, really who you are, where you came from, why real estate and kind of bring us current and, you know, and uh, tell us tell, give a little of your bio. Yeah, so that's... Um you know, because I, I wrote the book. And so I'm doing a, right. a handful of these podcasts and, and people right. are like, hey, when did you get your start? Where you know, was real estate? And it was interesting because it was actually a, a, a couple months ago, I was at my mom's house. Um, and on her fridge, she has a photo of my brother and I, my brother's name is Gabe. Um, and we bought a house in Northern California when I was a little kid, it was built in 1888. And it was an old farmhouse that was the, the head farmhouse of a thousand acre orchard. Uh, mm -hmm. They did mandarins primarily, but they had a lot of other fruit trees. And we bought this house in the in the 80s. And we lived uh, a family of five in a 16 foot camp trailer. And we fixed up this old farmhouse. Wow. Um, as a kid, I had no idea that 16 foot camp trailer was that small. But those photos show me and my brother carrying a sheet of plywood and I was like maybe eight to 10 and my brother was maybe, you know, six to eight or somewhere in there. There's another photo. You go to the album of us taking baths and wheelbarrows. Uh, this house like didn't have a foundation. It just sat on rocks. We jacked it up. We poured a foundation. And so I could use the, the nails that were bent um, and I would straighten them out in the scrap lumber to build, you know, forts or build things. Mm -hmm. And so even though I got started professionally real estate investing after my career in the military or a very short stint in the military, you know, 20 years ago, I actually see that that tail and that string back to me being a kid, kind of essentially growing up on a construction site yeah. and fixing up an old building. And now I own historic and old buildings that we're fixing up and converting office buildings to apartments or you know whatever the the the, the process of that we're, we're doing so i kind of feel like it's been almost my entire life that i have mm -hmm. been in real estate and specifically to this place and it's so it's it's really easy to look back and see that 30 40 years ago that tail or that string that has tied me and brought me up to this point to where i am that doesn't give you the current story 20 years ago, I got into uh, investing. Um, I, I got out of the army. I did air assault infantry and I was 23. I read this this book, it's a purple and gold book. And uh, you yeah. know, I'm sure you know uh, yeah. what I'm talking right. about. It was right. rich dad, poor dad. And I was like, this is what I wanna do. And, um, but I didn't, I didn't have skill sets. I didn't have podcasts like this lifetime, you know, like it didn't exist. And there was, this is before Google, before YouTube, you know, the internet kind of was around, but the access to information and, you know, to be honest, a, a, a limiting belief that I just didn't have enough skill sets or knowledge to do what I wanted to do. So it took me a few years of process to get in doing my first deal, but I bartended at a golf course. I got around other rich guys and I was like, Hey, I'm 23. I want to grab the tiger by its tail. I want to build skyscrapers. What do I do? And they said, get in construction. Hmm. I was like, what? That's not, no, I want to build the thing. And the advice I got was it doesn't matter what you do in real estate. There's a contractor involved mm -hmm. building a subdivision, moving dirt, 
remodeling your kitchen, there's a contractor involved, building a skyscraper, there's contractors, multiple contractors, and you have a very unique dance because what it's worth and what it costs to build it and then that leftover profit, you and your contractor are going to compete over that remaining profit. Contractors wanna make as much money as possible, you wanna make as much money as possible, so it's this delicate dance partnership you need each other but it's also quasi adversarial mm -hmm. and so they said everyone that got into construction and come from the trades instantaneously knows what things should cost and how long they should take and so you can learn it from school or you can go figure it out in the trades and you have a shorter learning curve so that's what i did i got in commercial real estate 20 years ago uh, uh, via a, com a commercial construction company and I was doing stuff for equity office properties. Uh, Sam Zell, I didn't know who he was. Um, and subsequent, I also kind of see that tale of distress. He was known as the grave dancer. He bought a lot of distressed assets. He was buying office buildings in Walnut Creek and the East Bay and I was fixing them up as a superintendent and then a project manager and subsequently got into flipping a lot of houses and then a very sad subprime crash i was living in phoenix and had a portfolio of houses and i remember robert kiyosaki telling me you know be cautious young man uh you know be cautious you know when you're buying and getting 105 percent financing on on houses that you know ultimately leads to demise at some point um i was like you you have to understand like i'm buying these things at a discount the market would have to correct and go down more than 20%. And when has it ever gone down more than 20%? Wah, wah, wah. A few years later, I'm sitting in Tucson crying on a street corner. Dear Lord, can I be worth no money? Because I have a negative net worth. House, I owe way more than these houses are worth. Robert was right. I was wrong. Uh, I, I thought I was smarter, you know, you know. But, uh, and then in subsequent, you know, building back up uh, post subprime is a lot of things that dive into the the book and diving into distress I, I got kicked in the teeth and got back to it well listen i want to make you feel better because you don't know my story and i lost 50 million dollars in 2009 8 9 and 10 so i i you know maybe you lost more but but i haven't met somebody yet so uh you know if it makes you feel any better but uh you know i love so many things that you said that i want to i want to circle back to and i was just thinking about you know i had all these antebellum houses that i owned back in the day pre-1900 houses i'm sure you remember pulling out those nails that were wedges instead of like a regular nail that square you see in those yeah. Yeah, square, like you've seen those old houses and, and, and windows that have ropes in them to pull them up with weights and so on yeah, and the so lead forth. Weights, yeah. 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 Which is, it's just been a real treat. And you know, some of these old houses I got used to have these fireplaces that were so ornate, like, like, like they sell them for tens of thousands of dollars. Now they're all wood carved and, you know, and just beautiful, um, you know, just a lot of cool stuff with those, with those old places like that. So that's really the way you described your, you know, that part of your life was really very, very cool. Um, and uh, hats off to your parents for going after it like that. And you talked about limiting beliefs as well, which is something we talk about a lot on this show. And, and, you know, so many people have them. And, you know, there's a reason the acronym for belief systems is BS, because, you know, they really are. And, and so many people just don't get it. And, and, uh, but, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, awesome, awesome story. And so, uh, and great advice about getting into construction, uh, to get into real estate. And, and my God, you work for, for, if not the best, one of the best investors on the planet, uh, Sam Zell. Holy cow. How cool is that? I mean, that's, yeah, so that's I was just a one contractor of my working for, for equity. No, I got it, so, but yeah, still, but, yeah. yeah, but still that is really, really cool. Um, you know, like I say, he's, he's, a uh, unbelievable, but, uh, in fact, I just heard him interviewed on, uh, I think it was Tim Ferriss's show. It's been a while since he got interviewed, but just brilliant. And his story about immigrating, uh, basically barely surviving, uh, um, immigration, uh, um, but really cool story. Anyway, anyway, I digress. So, so you did, so were you buying distressed assets or talk about, cause I mean, what's the title of your book? Distressed, uh, uh catching knives. What's the rest of it? Hold it up. Yeah. Again. Guide to invite, uh, buying distressed commercial assets. Guide to buying distressed commercial assets, which is, you know, I mean, awesome. And so, so talk about how you, 
learned what is in that book and maybe talk about an asset that was distressed that you purchased if you did or how that all came about, please? Yeah. So um, subprime meltdown, right? You know, 2008, right. Uh, crying in my Wheaties. Right. Um, you know, uh, no, I did not lose $50 million. Yeah, but it's I, all right. I, still, I lost it's still, everything. And it still it sucked. Bigger. It still yeah, sucked. It, Let's be honest. Okay. Very much so. My goal, right. I, had, I had this goal. I was very myopically focused on being a millionaire before 30. Mm -hmm. And I achieved it. Right. And, um, but, you know, what I, I realized, and actually you mentioned Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss mm -hmm. is the next kind of like big book milestone because mm -hmm. that came out in like 08 or 09. The four hour like, work week. The four hour work yeah. week. And, yeah. and I didn't even have the money to be able to really buy it. So I would walk over to the bookstore back when they had bookstores mm. um, and I would read it in the lobby okay. an hour, a couple hours at a time. I go put it back on the bookshelf and then walk back. And it was like that, you know, and the people that have read it, it's not about working four hours in a work week is how do you 10 X your, your abilities and through mm -hmm. systemizing um, aspects. And so as I sat into, and we also mentioned earlier before it started recording, the GoBundance group is, right. it, it, I didn't get involved in that until, you know, last, you know, five, six years. But mm -hmm. I realized that least importantly was I lost money. On that journey to achieve money, I was bankrupt in many, many other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. My health, my relationships, my, you know, and my brother said, hey, Jake, you're an asshole. Like, I don't, I don't want to hang out with you. You know, you're mm -hmm. just solely focused on money. Uh, I had a relationship that I thought I was going to get married. We, that kind of, you know, blew apart. I was 70 pounds overweight, wow. um, you know, a lot of things and just like every single aspect. And, and I think it is very easy for men in general to get and, and gravitate towards where they have accolades. And when that is a, because of money is, was let's go do that. And I did more and more of that in, in, in that process of losing everything. I got the blessing and the ability to look at my life in a holistic kind of way, mm -hmm. also reading Tim Ferriss and then using that as a, a magnifying glass to expand my mind. I realized money's maybe one fifth, one eighth of what it is to have and live a real life. And so I, and this is a journey and I'm not saying that I'm there or successful in that, but I've started making progress in every single way that I also realize subsequently, I am going to do real estate for the rest of my life. And I'm going to do this for another hundred years plus. And so when I realized that I said, I'm getting back into real estate, even though I just lost everything, you know, got kicked, I dragged through the gutter and bounced at the, the rock bottom. So I got in and started buying distressed assets. It was not on my balance sheet. My credit was shot. I'd, I right. ran out of money. I had two foreclosures. The last two houses I ran out, I r was out of money before I ran out of properties. Mm -hmm. And so they had to go to foreclosure. So I did not have the capabilities financially to do that. So I had to understand and build out or at least leverage other people's balance mm -hmm. sheets or experience or capital and then create systems. And so I worked in the trenches for a guy that was a family office. That's what they call him now. It used to be just, we called them rich guys. Mm -hmm. um, he was a rich guy. He was a home builder. He built 10,000 homes, sold, sold to Lennar for three, 400 million before the wow. crash because he'd wow. seen this happen before. Oh, and wow. he was like, I'm out. And uh, so he was sitting on a lot of cash and he says, it's time there's blood in the streets. And that's actually one of the quotes that I use from Baron Rothschild. Yep. It is that there's time, you know, when the blood is in the streets is the time to buy, even if the blood is your own. Yep. Oh, I love that. I love and that. So I, I was like, the expression. blood was mine. Oh, like it was it. like yours, mine. It was combined. And so I got back and started buying at foreclosures at trustee mm -hmm. sales. We aggregated, put together single family rental portfolios. We scaled this. I don't know. I've done 12, 1300 flips in 23 states mm -hmm. that gravitated to wanting to do bigger deals. We sold some of those off to institutionals, the Tricons and Colony and, and Invitation Homes and the others. And so we, we understood that playing just ahead of the institutional capital is our kind of you know thing that we're most successful at because we only mm. see a sliver of success in that market or the the trending that way private equity institutional capital needs you know 10 data points mm -hmm. and so what we're doing is we just play a little bit of ahead of the institutional capital and assemble these 
So from distressed assets, um, a foreclosure, I bought a school, uh, mm. a preschool. Uh, one of them in foreclosure, REO, I was able to remodel it and bring, had another tenant uh, that was going to take it over that, that property and get an SBA loan, bought it for a million dollars, did you know half a million dollars worth of TI out specifically for them and then sold it for 3 million bucks. Very nice, very well, nice. You know, kind of doing those things. Then that leveled into uh, office buildings and then land and then warehouses. And then there's other things. And what I talk about in the book is commercial real estate, they take the gloves off. Mm -hmm. Residential, you know, you have a lot of disclosures. You have a lot of disclaimers. You have a lot of people that protections. are protections in, in place. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate, it's buyer beware. And if you get screwed over, it's your own stupid fault mm -hmm. that you have a contaminated site. There's properties that you could give me for free. Here you go. Here's 10 acres of land. It's free. And I'd be like, I wouldn't touch it. Because let, let me expand so on that for one second, if you don't mind. I'd like sure. to expand. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, this oh. is a really important point. And I teach this in my boot camps. Um, guys, I don't care if you can buy a deal with seller financing, commercial, we're talking commercial deals. If you can buy it with seller financing and there's no requirement for a phase one environmental, you always get a phase one environmental because if there was a dry cleaner there or there was a gas station there, there was something weird about that property and, and you buy, you just bought it yesterday and the EPA finds out about it today. Guess who pays to clean it up? Doesn't matter where, where it came from, who did it, where, where it's it's you. So so I just wanted to hammer that point home, Jake. I apologize. Please continue. No, because yeah. and that's the thing that I talk about the you know distress, and so people think, oh, it's going to foreclosure. It's got to right. be a good deal. I can right. buy it at ten cents on the dollar. Right. And so I, I talk through a lot of, and you have a perfect example of that. Mm -hmm. A perfect example of a dry cleaner was there. 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. They use so many chemicals that contaminates the dirt and it, you might not be able to finance it or sell it for another 10 years. How much property taxes do you have? How much, you know, are you going to spend a million dollars cleaning that up to get it to where you can even sell it? So that's why I was like, you have to understand what you're getting involved in. Mm -hmm. And there, and part of it is, is I've been doing this professionally investing for 20 years. And guess what? I have a master's degree in international real estate and finance, and I've done thousands and th tens of thousands of transactions, and I don't rely on how smart I am. A collective team is way smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. A due diligence checklist is way better. Why do pilots use checklists? Why do surgeons use checklists? Because the downside is somebody dies. I'm not saying if you buy a bad commercial deal, you're gonna die or a real estate deal, you may feel like it. There's been very real times that I felt like, man, this, I don't know, like bury me, like just put me in dirt. And so like, that's why I put together that book was just because something is cheap doesn't mean it's a good deal. Now, does it have a checklist in it of some sort or, or, or you mentioned checklist? Yeah, so we give away some of those things, some due diligence checklist to some bonus okay. material for people. Uh, I okay. actually started you know, teaching a, a course on, on due diligence on just net lease deals because I see people aping into them. They're like, oh, I got seller finance or creative things. Let me go sign a personal guarantee on the bank for $8 million. And you'd be like, what if your tenant doesn't renew in 18 months? Right, right. Or they go under for some reason, uh, you know, whatever. But uh, well, so that's that sounds really good. I've also got uh, guys uh, a due diligence checklist. It's called my multifamily property tool book. Now yours is regarding single tenant leasing. I wanted to just mention it since we're talking about due diligence checklist. If you go to my website rodcleef.com or go to real estate with Rod, it's down at the bottom. It's called the uh, tool book, and it's it's pretty much a due diligence checklist on steroids as well. So um, you'll. Um, you'll get value from that. Um, so you're doing some development right now. Um, you're also, um, well, actually, I, had you finished your thought regarding the, I'm sorry, I don't want to cut you off because we were talking about the book and talking about distressed assets. We're talking about stumbling blocks. Um, please continue. Let's continue down that path because that's fascinating. No, and that's, I mean, there's, there's lots of different ways to buy distressed assets. And I use some mm -hmm. examples of that in the book. You okay. can buy foreclosures. You can buy the note. Mm -hmm. You can buy 
uh, and foreclose on it. You can position yourself as, is you know, seller financing, creative financing. You know, you're just tired of your shopping center. You're post pandemic. Half the restaurants have failed. You know, you got a gas station. Maybe, well, actually, maybe a gas station would be a pretty good deal right now. <laughs> uh, I think I paid six dollars a gallon the other day. I was right, like, right. Uh, I hope that they have profits in that uh, percentage of it. But uh, uh, let me interject something because we talked about it before we started recording, and and that was your timing on the release of this book because the market is so freaking hot right now. You're thinking distressed asset, yeah, whatever. Where am Where am I going to find a distressed asset, guys? Just wait. Okay. Now, it, I don't think it's going to happen this year. There's too much pent up demand. But with the current administration stupidity that's going on right now, and we won't go down that rabbit hole, but but I think it's inevitable that we're going to have a correction at some point. So at that point, that book will be incredibly valuable. Um, so, you know, uh, anyway, please continue. No, that's... Uh... I wrote it during the pandemic, the start right. of, of COVID. I was like, this is- It's happening. Show. I thought so too. I thought it's coming. What I've been doing. Yeah, I know it's right. coming. And of course it was a blip, but- uh, but uh, Real estate but, values tripled in the same time, in the right, time period right. of the book came out. Right. But uh, to your point and to your exactly what you think is the fundamentals of putting together a good team. Mm -hmm. It is not about how smart you are or what you know. No. Uh, again, uh, and I don't know, I don't remember if I put it in the book, but there is, and we, we talked about this briefly, limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you something that hit me over the head like a two by four. Um, I was, you know, I have a goal I mentioned earlier to build a skyscraper, a tower mm -hmm. project. Um, maybe that is, you know, uh, some people say a phallic symbol of trying to, you know, of, of status. I was like, well, whatever it is, I have, since I was a kid, you know, really been fascinated with that. And it's something that I want to do. So in my head, I just always was like, I got to do, have a bunch of experience. I got to go get this. I have my broker's license. Now I have this. And now I've done hundreds of millions of dollars worth of transaction. Now I can have the ability to go do that. And so I bring that up because I met a kid in Miami, kid, he was 28. Mm -hmm. He had just finished a 42 story condo project wow. that he had sold for over a hundred million dollars and he made $30 million profit wow. off of it. Wow. And I was like, tell me more, like, tell me about this. And I was like, what do you, do you come from money? Did you, you know, do this? Did you grow up? Does your dad have a construction company? Like all these things. And he was like, no, nah, I just came to this country, th you know, a couple years ago, I used to live in Venezuela. I know nothing. I have never done construction. Don't have a background in finance. My dad don't even know my dad. I came to this country. I have no money. And I literally, but I was just like, America is the land of opportunity and you can do anything. I came out and there was a piece of property listed in Miami Beach for sale on LoopNet. And it was, I don't know what the amount was, $10 million. And so he's like, I submitted an offer on it. And there was a contractor sign and an architect sign down the street for another building for a 40 story building. I just said, hey, can you do that same thing on this one? And they put together plans. And he's like, and then I just started going around Miami and going to real estate meetings and saying, hey, I'm gonna do this project, I'm gonna do this project. And he's like, people followed along and started putting together investments and said, we'll do it with you, we'll do it with you, do that. And then we got a sales team and we started selling the condos. And he's like, he did no market study. He did no due diligence. He did no financing. They sold out the entire condo project. They built the project. The contractor's like, hey, it's $70 million to build this. He sold it and just said like, okay, it's 30% more than whatever it cost and made, you know, again, $28 million on the- When was this? When was this? A few years ago, uh, about four or five years ago. So he uh -huh. had perfect timing of market conditions and other things like that. But the very first project, the naivety and just that, the fact that you come to this country and he just did it through action. And that's why I said it hit me over the head like a two by four. How many of my beliefs are limiting beliefs that prevent me from doing the thing that I am dreaming of doing that he just simply did with nothing because he created action. 
He was default aggressive. I just finished Jocko Willenick's training uh, program. Default mm -hmm. aggressive action solves so many things. It's like just showing up is probably 80 or 90% of what we need to do. Action, action, action. Love, just, it. Like, again, Love it. You're, you're, speaking, you're, you're speaking my language. I mean, this is, you know, my, 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 my quote is massive freaking action. Bottom line, like you said, action mitigates 80 to 90% of the issues. You know, you don't have to see the whole path. You can drive all the way across the country at night, seeing 50 feet in front of you. You just have to take that next freaking step. The next step will be revealed and so on. Uh, and, and, you know, action mitigates fear. It, it, it's just, you just, but you have to do it. I love it. Absolutely love it. Uh, what an incredible story, you know, just, just fire ready aim, right? He, the guy, they, they put an offer on a property, didn't have a clue what he was doing. I mean, just, uh, I, I love hearing that. Um, and what an extreme example of that, uh, that you, you're lucky enough to meet. Um, so put a team together, anything else pop into, into your head before we, uh, sign off here about, you know, in your book, you, you put, you know, and, and, and guys, you know, that that's likens this whole team concept, how you're smarter in a group likens to what uh, Napoleon Hill talks about in his book, Think and Grow Rich, about the power of the mastermind. When you get two like minds together with the same general de definite, he calls it definite of purpose, same general direction they're headed. They create this third intangible nine that's greater than the sum of the parts. And so, you know, anytime I'm making a big decision, I always inv involve my entire team because it's always a better decision every time. But anything else beyond that, buddy, Jake? You know, so part of the thing is, is, and the reason I, I, I titled the book Catching Knives, I don't know mm -hmm. if you've heard the, the, the saying, don't catch falling knives. Right. It's a stock market term. Like typically it's like, let, let, the, let it hit the ground. That works for Tesla stock. That works for Apple stock because there's an abundance of those. Mm -hmm. Commercial real estate actually has some scarcity to it. That property in downtown, may sell once a generation. You know, uh, right. families will own something for 30, 40, 50 years, a good cash producing and a good location. And so what you need to be doing is doing your homework ahead of time. And so some of my best deals have been things that have taken me three, four, five years to actually acquire. Mm. And it was, I reached out, I started doing due diligence. I started collecting uh, financials on it, financials on the neighboring buildings, financials and market conditions. So like I had a better, broader perspective and I could move faster than mm -hmm. other people when that opportunity did present itself. And so it's like by doing your homework ahead of time, there's not distress in the market right now. I mean, there's distress in every market at all times, right, sure, but it's sure. not the abundance of distress right. that, you know, maybe that we were thinking about. And so by doing your homework ahead of time is you're preparing yourself, you're opening your mind, you're opening your aperture to the possibility of doing that deal and then also getting data points. So if you lack the experience, but you can get a really good deal or a good discount on it, money will find you you're yep. missing or, or missing the, the, the capital or whatever it is, your homework. And so like to me, my superpower is not only being persistent, but is my research. Like I'm gonna know more than everyone else out there. I didn't go to those top tier schools. I didn't have a trust fund. My dad was a police officer. We lived in a 16 foot camp trailer. I grew up mm -hmm. in a mobile home park for a time, but it was like, but what I do have is my efforts. No one can take about my efforts. And so I can be more persistent and put in more effort and put in more research in something. And that's what I talk about in those books. These are things that you do and you can control. Mm -hmm. And then when you're prepared for something and when those opportunities do present themselves, it gives you that capability to take action quickly in the direction that you want to go. And also defining out what is what is it that you want to do? There's so many people, that whole Alice in Wonderland, the Mad Hatter, like which direction do you want to go? Where do you want to go? And be like, I don't know. Then it doesn't really matter which way you're going. Yeah, no, I, I and that's, that's, that's the reason. Of your life. Right. That's the reason I'll tell you at my boot camp. So one of the first things we do is a goal setting workshop on steroids, because how the hell do you get anything if you don't know what it is? You've got to have clarity around your mission, your vision, the things that you want. Um, yeah, very, very nice. 
Well, listen, it's been a real treat to have you on, Jake. Uh, I, I, you've definitely added tremendous value. Guys, get his book, Catching Knives, and uh, uh, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate your wisdom, my friend. Absolutely. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, I think unlocking uh, the lifetime cash flow, it, it's, it's, these are some of the things I wish I, I had when I was younger, uh, the, the 20 years ago when I started. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Honestly, I had nobody to teach me back then. I was that kid, although I did it with houses. I bought 500 houses in Denver. We you know, didn't have a freaking clue what I was doing at the time. Wish I still had those damn houses right now. But anyway, hold, well, hold, listen, hold real estate long enough and it always it. works out. That's right. That's right. Jake, it was a real pleasure, buddy. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate it. Thanks, Rod. Take care. Rod, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. Now, I know you've been hard at work helping our warrior students do just that using our ACT methodology, which is awareness, close, and transform. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? You bet. Guys, we've been going nonstop for three years, building an amazing community of like-minded people. And our coaching students, which we call our warriors, have had extraordinary results. They've purchased thousands and thousands of units. And last year, we did over a thousand units with our students. And we're looking to grow this group and take it to the next level. We're looking for people who want to follow a proven framework that's really step by step and then leverage our systems and network to raise equity, to find and close deals, and to build partnerships nationwide. Now, our warrior community is finding success in any market cycle. So, if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become more of our incredible network and take advantage of the incredible opportunities that are coming very soon, apply to work with us at mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 72345 and we'll set up a call so you can check us out and we can check you out. That's mentorwithrod.com or text CRUSH to 72345.